Chapter 3 of The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Pirates. Chapter 3 The Man Up the Main. It occurred in the first watch, just after six bells. I was forward, sitting on the forehatch. No one was about the main deck. The night was exceedingly fine, and the wind had dropped away almost to nothing, so that the ship was very quiet. Suddenly I heard the second mate's voice. "'In the main rigging there! Who's that going aloft?' I sat up on the hatch and listened. There succeeded an intense silence. Then the second's voice came again. He was evidently getting wild. "'Do you damn well hear me? What the hell are you doing up there? Come down!' I rose to my feet and walked up to windward. From there I could see the break of the poop. The second mate was standing by the starboard ladder. He appeared to be looking up at something that was hidden from me by the topsails. As I stared, he broke out again. "'Hell and damnation, you blasted soldier! Come down when I tell you!' He stamped on the poop and repeated his order, savagely. But there was no answer. I started to walk aft. What had happened? Who had gone aloft? Who would be fool enough to go without being told? And then, all at once, a thought came to me. The figure Tammy and I had seen. Had the second mate seen something, someone? I hurried on, and then stopped suddenly. In the same moment, there came the shrill blast of the second's whistle. He was whistling for the watch, and I turned and ran to the forecastle to rouse them out. Another minute, and I was hurrying aft with them to see what was wanted. His voice met us halfway. "'Up the main, some of you, smartly now, and find out who that damned fool is up there. See what mischief he's up to!' "'Aye, aye, sir,' several of the men sung out, and a couple jumped into the weather-rigging. I joined them, and the rest were proceeding to follow." but the second shouted for some to go up to leeward, in case the fellow tried to get down that side. As I followed the other two aloft, I heard the second mate tell Tammy, whose timekeeping it was, to get down onto the main deck with the other prentice, and keep an eye on the fore and aft stays. "'He may try down one of them if he's cornered,' I heard him explain. "'If you see anything, just sing out for me right away.' Tammy hesitated. "'Well?' said the second mate sharply. "'Nothing, sir,' said Tammy, and went down onto the main deck. The first man to windward had reached the futtock shrouds. His head was above the top, and he was taking a preliminary look before venturing higher. "'See anything, Jock?' asked Plummer, the man next above me. "'Nah,' said Jock tersely, and climbed over the top, and so disappeared from my sight." The fellow ahead of me followed. He reached the futtock rigging and stopped to expectorate. I was close at his heels and he looked down to me. "'What's up, anyway?' he said. "'What's he seen? Who are we chasing after?' I said I didn't know, and we swung up into the topmost rigging. I followed on. The chaps on the lee side were about level with us. Under the foot of the topsail I could see Tammy and the other prentice down on the main deck looking upwards. The fellows were a bit excited in a sort of subdued way, though I am inclined to think there was far more curiosity and perhaps a certain consciousness of the strangeness of it all. I know that, looking to leeward, there is a tendency to keep well together in which I sympathized. "'Must be a bloomin' stowaway,' one of the men suggested. I grabbed at the idea instantly. Perhaps and then, in a moment, I dismissed it. I remembered how that first thing had stepped over the rail into the sea. That matter could not be explained in such a manner. With regard to this, I was curious and anxious. I had seen nothing this time. What could the second mate have seen? I wondered. Were we chasing fancies, or was there really someone, something real, among the shadows above us? My thoughts returned to that thing Tammy and I had seen near the log-reel. 
I remembered how incapable the second mate had been of seeing anything then. I remembered how natural it had seemed that he should not be able to see. I caught the word stowaway again. After all, that might explain away this affair. It would. My train of thought was broken suddenly. One of the men was shouting and gesticulating. I seize him! I seize him! He was pointing upwards, over our heads. Where? said the man above me. Where? I was looking up for all that I was worth. I was conscious of a certain sense of relief. It is real, then, I said to myself. I screwed my head round and looked along the yards above us. Yet still I could see nothing, nothing except shadows and patches of light. Down on the deck I caught the second mate's voice. Have you got him? he was shouting. Not yet, sir, sung out the lowest man on the lee side. We seize him, sir, added Coyne. I don't, I said. There he is again, he said. We had reached the Tagallant rigging, and he was pointing up to the royal yard. You're a fuel, Coyne, that's what you are. The voice came from above. It was Jock's, and there was a burst of laughter at Coyne's expense. I could see Jock now. He was standing in the rigging just below the yard. He had gone straight away up, while the rest of us were mooning over the top. "'You're a fuel, Coyne,' he said again. "'And I'm thinking the second's just as saft.' He began to descend. "'Then there's no one?' I asked. "'Nah,' he said briefly. As we reached the deck, the second mate ran down off the poop. He came towards us with an expectant air. "'You've got him?' he asked confidently. There wasn't anyone, I said. What? He nearly shouted. You're hiding something, he continued angrily and glancing from one to another. Out with it. Who was it? We're hiding nothing, I replied, speaking for the lot. There's no one up there. The second looked round upon us. Am I a fool? he asked contemptuously. There was an assenting silence. I saw him myself, he continued. Tammy here saw him. He wasn't over the top when I first spotted him. There's no mistake about it. It's all damned rot saying he's not there. Well, he's not, sir, I answered. Jock went right up to the royal yard. The second mate said nothing in immediate reply, but went aft a few steps and looked up the main. Then he turned to the two prentices. "'Sure you two boys didn't see anyone coming down from the main?' he inquired suspiciously. "'Yes, sir,' they answered together. "'Anyway,' I heard him mutter to himself, "'I'd have spotted him myself if he had.' "'Have you any idea, sir, who it was you saw?' I asked at this juncture. He looked at me keenly. "'No,' he said. He thought for a few moments, while we all stood about in silence, waiting for him to let us go. "'By the holy poker!' he exclaimed suddenly. "'But I ought to have thought of that before.' He turned and eyed us individually. "'You're all here?' he asked. "'Yes, sir,' we said in a chorus. I could see that he was counting us. Then he spoke again. "'All of you men stay here where you are. Tammy, you go into your place and see if the other fellows are in their bunks. Then come back and tell me.' Smartly now. The boy went, and he turned to the other prentice. You get along forward to the forecastle, he said. Count the other watch, then come aft and report to me. As the youngster disappeared along the deck to the forecastle, Tammy returned from his visit to the glory hole to tell the second mate that the other two prentices were sound asleep in their bunks. Whereupon the second bundled him off to the carpenter's and sailmaker's berth to see whether they were turned in. While he was gone, the other boy came aft and reported that all the men were in their bunks and asleep. Sure? the second asked him. Quite, sir, he answered. The second mate made a quick gesture. Go and see if the steward is in his berth, he said abruptly. It was plain to me that he was tremendously puzzled. 
You've something to learn yet, Mr. Second Mate, I thought to myself. Then I fell to wondering to what conclusions he would come. A few seconds later, Tammy returned to say that the carpenter, sailmaker, and doctor were all turned in. The second mate muttered something and told him to go down into the saloon to see whether the first and third mates, by any chance, were not in their berths. Tammy started off, then halted. "'Shall I have a look into the old man's place, sir, while I'm down there?' he inquired. "'No,' said the second mate. "'Do what I told you, and then come back and tell me. If anyone's to go into the captain's cabin, it's got to be me.' Tammy said, "'Aye, aye, sir.' and skipped away, up on to the poop. While he was gone, the other prentice came up to say that the steward was in his berth, and that he wanted to know what the hell he was fooling round his part of the ship for. The second mate said nothing for nearly a minute. Then he turned to us and told us we might go forward. As we moved off in a body and talking in undertones, Tammy came down from the poop and went up to the second mate. I heard him say that the two mates were in their berths asleep. Then he added, as if it were an afterthought, "'So's the old man.' "'I thought I told you,' the second mate began. "'I didn't, sir,' Tammy said. "'His cabin door was open.' The second mate started to go aft. I caught a fragment of a remark he was making to Tammy. "'Accounted for the whole crew. I'm—' He went up onto the poop. I did not catch the rest. I had loitered a moment. Now, however, I hurried after the others. As we neared the forecastle, one bell went, and we roused out the other watch, and told them what jinx we had been up to. "'I reckon he must be rocky,' one of the men remarked. "'Not him,' said another. "'He's been having forty winks on the break, and dreamed his mother-in-law had come on her visit, friendly-like.' There was some laughter at this suggestion, and I caught myself smiling along with the rest, though I had no reason for sharing their belief that there was nothing in it at all. "'Might have been a stowaway, you know,' I heard Coyne, the one who had suggested it before, remark to one of the A.B.'s named Stubbins, a short, rather surly-looking chap. "'Might have been hell,' returned Stubbins. "'Stowaways ain't such fools as all that.' I don't know, said the first. I wish I'd arsed the second what he thought about it. I don't think it was a stowaway somehow, I said, chipping in. What would a stowaway want aloft? I guess he'd be trying more for the steward's pantry. You bet he would, every time, said Stubbins. He lit his pipe and sucked at it slowly. I don't understand it all they're saying, he remarked, after a moment's silence. Neither do I, I said. And after that I was quiet for a while, listening to the run of conversation on the subject. Presently my glance fell upon Williams, the man who had spoken to me about shatters. He was sitting in his bunk smoking and making no effort to join in the talk. I went across to him. What do you think of it, Williams? I asked. Do you think the second mate really saw anything? He looked at me with a sort of gloomy suspicion, but said nothing. I felt a trifle annoyed by his silence, but took care not to show it. After a few moments I went on. Do you know, Williams, I'm beginning to understand what you meant that night when you said there were too many shadows. What you mean, he said, pulling his pipe from out of his mouth and fairly surprised into answering. What I say, of course, I said. There are too many shadows. He sat up and leant forward out of his bunk, extending his hand and pipe. His eyes plainly showed his excitement. Have you seen? He hesitated and looked at me, struggling inwardly to express himself. Well, I prompted. For perhaps a minute he tried to say something. Then his expression altered suddenly from doubt and something else more indefinite, to a pretty grim look of determination. He spoke. "'I'm blind,' he said, "'if I don't take her payday out of her shatters or no shatters.' I looked at him with astonishment. 
What's it got to do with your getting a payday out of her? I asked. He nodded his head with a sort of stolid resolution. Look here, he said. I waited. The crowd cleared. He indicated with his hand and pipe towards the stern. You mean in Frisco? I said. Yes, he replied, and with art a scent of their pie, I stied. I comprehended him suddenly. You think they saw? I hesitated. Then I said, Shadows? He nodded, but said nothing. And so they all bunked? He nodded again and began tapping out his pipe in the edge of his bunk board. And the officers and the skipper? I asked. Freshens, he said, and got out of his bunk, for eight bells was striking. End of chapter three.